The White Swan and the Red Pen. This series of chits is focused largely on science and how it works. It's about how if you think that it is possible to accumulate evidence for a theory, then a red pen is evidence in favour of the claim that all swans are white. How is this so? And Brett, aren't you one of those people who keeps on going on about how you cannot have evidence for a theory anyway? Well, yes. Yes, I am. But let's understand the reasons against this claim at an even deeper level than I usually go on about. It's not enough to know that falsification works, that the existence of one black swan refutes all swans are white. You have to also know why the alternative perspective, which is almost universally subscribed outside of what is called critical rationalism, is false. It needs to somehow become a deep part of your thinking that positive evidence just isn't a thing, and it never can be. Which is to say, you cannot have evidence for a theory, evidence that supports a theory or makes it more likely to be true and so on. That is not only unnecessary, but it's actually absurd. So let's see why momentarily. But Let me first recap why it's unnecessary. Once you have an explanation of the evidence, then it no longer cries out for support because there are no alternative theories. There is just the one, the explanation. But okay, imagine you're in the rare position of having two good explanations. Well, then, if you do find yourself in that rare position of having two or more good explanations, then the function of evidence is to decide between those theories already guessed. When evidence does this, it also happens to serve the simultaneous purpose of becoming the so-called explicandum, technically speaking. In other words, the thing to be explained. The explanation is there to explain the evidence. The evidence is there to decide between explanations. Okay, so all of that means evidence in support of a theory is unnecessary. But why is it also absurd. We're going to take a little lesson in logic here. Consider, if you like, the claim, all swans are white, so often held up as the pedestrian example of either how falsification works, you know, you find the unexpected, a black swan in other words, or maybe these days a translucent one would be more unexpected. Or The all swans are white thing is a way of teasing out exactly what Bayesian epistemology is trying to get at. How many swans need to be observed before we can say it's probably the case that all swans are white? Or likely? What's the threshold? And once you do employ Bayes' theorem, by the way, that almost never happens, what is called Bayesianism never much involves Bayes' theorem actually being deployed. Well, you say you update your initial prior probability in light of more white swans to 85% confidence that all swans are white. Well, then you can conclude with something less than certainty that all swans are white. Of course, how certain you are that the 85% number you've come up with is 100% correct, no one can say. But let us put aside all of those concerns about how many swans need to be observed before concluding all swans are white. Put aside that no finite list of observations, like seeing a thousand white swans or a million swans, can ever logically be equivalent to a universal claim about all swans or all anythings. And let us even put aside Science is not about making claims like all swans are white in the first place. It's about explaining the world. Let us put all that aside. The idea that one can have evidence in support of a theory or claim like all swans are white by finding ever more white swans is logically equivalent to my looking on my desk and seeing any random thing there, like a red pen, as also evidence in support of all swans are white. If that seems absurd to you, it is. 
But this is one of the counterintuitive things about logic and one of the absurd consequences of the evidence can support a theory account of how science functions. It is a problem for that idea, but not a problem for falsification or explanation. What on earth am I talking about? What I'm talking about is the red pen on my desk is a non-white, non-swan. All swans are white is logically equivalent to all non-white things are not swans. In formal logic, this is known as the contrapositive. So given this logical fact about reality, anything at all in the universe you can point to that is not a swan and isn't white is evidence in favour of all swans are white, if you think there is such a thing as evidence in favour of or support of any claim at all. So on the inductivist or Bayesian account of things, every time you observe non-white non-swans, basically everything in the universe, your confidence in your theory about the truth of all swans are white should increase, precisely because it amounts to being evidence in support of your theory. Do you see how absurd the inductive account of science is, of Bayesianism, of non-explanatory falsifiable conjectural scientific knowledge? Alternatives would have it that Absolutely everything, everywhere, all the time counts as evidence in favour of your theory. Or at least almost everything does. Science does not consist of claims like all swans are white. It consists of explanations. Evidence cannot be used to support a theory. It serves only to decide between explanations already guessed. No amount of gathering more evidence about the world allows us to extrapolate general truths about it. What we have are problems. That's where we begin. Our ideas at times fail to account for what is out there in the world. In science, to resolve this clash of ideas between what we think and what we observe, well, then we have to use our imaginations to conjecture, guess, guess into existence a new and better explanation. Once we've done that, once we can explain the problematic observation, we have a solution. And once we have that, there's no need to further support it because, well, it's all we've got. It's the solution. It's the good explanation. This series of chits is also now a blog post on my website. I give credit to a lecturer of mine who first posed the question to a class I was taking in formal philosophical logic at the time, He held aloft a red whiteboard marker and said, how is this evidence in favour of the claim that all swans are white? It took me until the bus ride home to figure out what the answer was, and I was excited to come to the next lecture and give the answer, but I was beaten to the punch by a whole bunch of other people who threw their hands up immediately as well. And of course they did. It was a class of logic students. (laughs) The problem with fallibilism. This series of chits is associated with an article which I'm linking to here because it provides a whole bunch of links that are referred to throughout this series of chits. The problem with fallibilism is that it is not well understood. Well, there I've said it. So why bother going on with anything more in this piece? Well, I want to attempt to understand why exactly this simple idea is so deceptively simple and therefore easily mistaken for something else. Moreover, many who claim to be fallibilists of some kind often turn out to be dogmatists of another kind, which means they never were thoroughgoing fallibilists to begin with. I don't like labels. I'd prefer they not be applied to people and instead reserved for ideas as a matter of convenience. People are not defined by their ideas, but rather the capacity to create them in the first place. Labels tend to negate whatever else a person might say on the topic once you think they are a rationalist of some kind, for example. Even the bright and cheery optimist label has become a little clicky of late. But more importantly, it too 
is often too easily misunderstood. I endorse optimism in David Deutsch's sense of the word. That's what I prefer to say, rather than answering to, I'm an optimist, like some yellow-pilled cultist with a big silly grin. But fallibilist? Well, I don't much mind admitting I might be wrong. And to be accused of such is never an insult, even about fallibilism. And we'll come to that. So, you can call me fallible. I don't much go in for those pilled things, though I've already mentioned yellow-pilled. I don't know if it's already a thing, yellow-pilled. But if fallibilism was to be pilled, I guess it'd be pink. Is pink a colour? Is it? It's not on the rainbow. It's negative green, as some physicists have joked, for example, in this video. Pink is a kind of mysterious colour. Is it a boy's colour or a girl's colour? At one point it was certainly regarded as a boy's colour, or at least it was considered masculine anyway. Now, of course, it's a girl's colour, although with what we can only call the 2020s gender wars that we're now in the midst of, the meaning of pink is once again up in the air. So if a really butch masculine man thinks a pink shirt is a just divine, is he or isn't he? You know what I mean. It's all questions. Get pink pilled. Become a fallibilist. I tweet now and again that one way to think about fallibilism is simply the stance that it is always possible to be wrong because there is something to be wrong about. Very few people are thoroughgoing fallibilists. Even fewer than that recognise fallibilism in others. The issue is that most people are either dogmatists, at least about something or other, or relativists, increasingly, and sometimes even the same people <laughs> on other issues. Dogmatism is the misconception that there exists something, usually many things for a dogmatist, about which it is impossible to be mistaken. What is often held aloft are things like 1 plus 1 equals 2, or Pythagoras' theorem, or well, everything in mathematics, much of science. Or, of course, in a conversation with a sufficiently adept fallibilist, the dogmatist will retreat, like George Custer, to the philosophical equivalent of Little Bighorn River. I think I exist. Descartes' cogito, their last stand. They think, these dogmatists, that because they think they are entitled to assert that it is absolutely certain, beyond all doubt, and impossible to be mistaken that, at least on this point, that they exist, that therefore there is something about which you are not fallible. They can't imagine how it could be otherwise, and so their lack of imagination on this point is somehow proof, in their minds, of truth. But why is it important for people to be absolutely certain they are in possession of a final truth? Isn't simply knowing something enough? Isn't simply knowing you exist enough? But Brett... Why does the distinction matter anyway? Who cares about the difference between knowing and possessing certain truth? It matters for two reasons, and very deeply. One, dogmatism everywhere is dangerous, and as Popper admonished, the doctrine that the truth is manifest is the root of all tyranny. And two, because only fallibilism always allows the possibility of infinite progress via continuous error correction. Admitting you can always be wrong, even about fallibilism, means that there is always more left to learn and understand. When it comes to Descartes' I think, therefore I am, or even just I exist, as being a statement, indeed a logical proposition, so they think, that one can utter as some kind of necessary truth about which one cannot possibly be mistaken, it can be difficult for many people, most people indeed, to doubt this. They desire a foundation and, following René Descartes, they think, well, this is it, the foundation. I am certain I exist. But 
A fallibilist needs no such foundation. They can pursue instead conjectural knowledge. On this, I agree with Descartes. I exist. I can say that honestly. There's no problem here. I can even add, rather unnecessarily, I know I exist. That's enough for me. So rather than say, it cannot possibly be false that I exist, or even, I am certain I exist, I just say, I know I exist. Or even, I exist. Just not infallibly. Because I'm not infallible about anything, ever, including, I exist. I can always improve my understanding of, I exist and correct errors in what I think about it. I might not know right now how to improve it, but that's true of almost everything I know, so there's nothing special about that particular claim. And much of what we know, like I exist, contains inexplicit content as well, like what the word exist means, or what I refers to, and so on and on and on. Much about any claim when you dig deep is inexplicit. Indeed, an infinite amount of inexplicit content lies there in an infinite potential well of inexplicit possibility. This infinite depth of the possibility for further understanding underscores the possibility of progress, the possibility for improvement, optimism. I cannot say how it might be possible that I exist, just might be false. But this, my failure of imagination on that point, is no proof that it might nevertheless be false. I am a fallible human. There are many things I might be unable to imagine. Now, having said all of this, especially saying all of this clearly and indeed coherently and even sometimes passionately, then the criticism comes. Well, you sound terribly dogmatic, Brett. Which, of course, comes down to tone, or not even tone, but rather perceived tone. It's rather like homophobia. One doesn't actually need to be homosexual to experience homophobia. One only has to be perceived to be homosexual. And so too with dogmatism. The thoroughgoing fallibilist holds the position that all dogmatism is wrong and is then accused of defending a dogma about how all dogmatism is wrong. But that is simply a misconception to do with playing word games and trying to hold the fallibilist to the meanings of terms and explanations that the dogmatists insist on. When I say, look, this is how it is. Fallibilism is the only reasonable stance to take. People think this is somehow self-refuting. Indeed, any time one explains any theory at all, like matter is made of atoms, or I know that evolution by natural selection explains the diversity of species, or the Big Bang happened, people throw accusations of dogmatism around. I know we people are universal explainers. That really gets people's backs up, especially in these times around discussions of AGI and AI. You can't know that. You're a dogmatist. You're refusing to consider the alternative. That's the accusations that come at you thick and fast when you try and explain this position about universal explainers. Let us linger on this related point just for a moment. Those who object to the claim, people can understand anything in principle, are arguing for a kind of anti-human alternative that human beings cannot, even in principle, understand some things. And yet I, like everyone else in history, has been steeped in that lesson. That lesson being that people, human beings, are rather pathetic creatures and we understand very little and we never will understand very much about this universe. We're just incapable of it. I know that argument well. Here, let me make the case. Firstly, our memories are limited because our brains are finite. There are certain things we just cannot comprehend. You, Brett, don't even understand the Korean language and yet you claim to have tried. If you're a universal explainer, 
find the successor theory to quantum theory right now. See, you can't. Therefore, you're not a universal explainer. I've just told you two things you cannot understand or you cannot do. You, Brett, are just dogmatically committed to a certain kind of faith claim about universal explainers. But all of that is just to ignore the explanation offered elsewhere about all of this, such as in this video here. I know the retorts and the objections. It takes time to appreciate the power of universality. What a deep shift in perspective it takes to appreciate this relationship between what a person is, how they explain and understand by generating models in their mind of anything else in physical reality and that physical reality itself. How, as David Deutsch explained it in his TED talk about chemical scum, the one structure comes to resemble the other. The mind and whatever else in physical reality exists that it is trying to explain. But if one does explain all that and says, that's just the way it is, baby, because that is what we know, and we know that because it literally follows from our rational understanding of the world, namely because we reject the supernatural, then the accusations of dogmatism begin to flow. Stating, it just is the case that X. We know X and we know X because our best explanation of science, quantum theory, implies X. Or our best theory of epistemology implies X. Conjectural knowledge growth implies X. None of that is dogmatic. All of those claims might be false. For a fallibilist, that goes without saying. Of course, when you do say that as a fallibilist, then the criticism immediately flips. A moment ago, the interlocutor accusing you of dogmatism now says, oh, so you think nothing is actually true. Relativist. This is the experience of the fallibilist. Stating as clearly as possible what we know and making the case with passion and curiosity and dare one say, fun and excitement, only to have that mistaken for dogmatism. At no point during what I sometimes call my tirades on my podcast, which in truth are really just monologue summaries of explanations about exciting parts of science and philosophy. At no point do I ever presume it's not possible that I'm wrong. I could always be wrong, but how tedious would that be to add that caveat after every single claim that I make? This might be wrong. I could be mistaken. And as I say, Having just made the exciting case for some bit of science or philosophy and being accused of dogmatism, and so adding the caveat, no, 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 I could always be wrong about all of this because of the universal fallibility of the process of knowledge creation, then you get accused of relativism. All this is because the only frame many have is either you're certain of certain truths, in other words, dogmatic in some sense as they are, or you're untethered to these foundational truths of reality entirely, and so therefore you're a relativist. So this is the problem with fallibilism. It's very poorly understood. It steps outside that frame. But misunderstanding fallibilism should be expected because oh, we're all fallible. All is a woven web of guesses.